is the DeFi Decoded Podcast by Nine Point Partners in cooperation with Prophecy DeFi. The ideas and opinions expressed in this podcast should not be taken as investment advice. Always consult with your financial advisor before investing. Awesome. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of DeFi Decoded. I'm your co-host, Alex Tapscott, here with Andrew Young. And today we are uh, delighted to be welcoming uh, a very special guest, Galia Bernardzi, who, uh, among many other things, is also on the Advisory Council of Prophecy DeFi with me and other people like uh, Sandeep Nailwal and uh, Peng Zhang. So Galia Bernardzi is the co-founder of Bancor, the world's first open source protocol ensuring on-chain liquidity between any blockchain-based asset, an inventor of the automated market maker, which is now a key building block of decentralized finance and something we've talked about at length on the show. More than $2 billion in token conversions have been processed via Bancor as the protocol impacts organizations and people across the globe from blockchain teams to real world communities issuing local currencies. Galia was recognized by Forbes and Glamour Magazine as a leading woman in crypto, and she has been featured on Bloomberg TV and CNBC and has spoken at the United Nations, TEDx, and the Oslo Freedom Forum on monetary theory and innovation. Galia previously co-founded Mytopia, the first social gaming company for smartphones, which was acquired by 888, and Particle Code, a cross-platform development technology for mobile applications, which was acquired by AppCelerator. She was a venture partner at Peter Thiel's Founders Fund, a founding member of Summit Powder Mountain, and the organizer of Bretton Woods 75, a commemoration event evaluating historic monetary accords. Okay, Galia, so uh, you come at this stuff pretty honestly and with a lot of uh, experience. Uh, one of the things I mentioned in the bio was that Bancor um, was a pioneer in creating the automated market maker, the AMM, which is basically, I said a building block, it's sort of one of the major building blocks of decentralized finance. So um, tell, us, tell us about that. Tell us about the genesis of Bancor and, and how you arrived at that form of technology as a key uh, feature? Sure, um, so thank you for the warm intro and, um, and for having me on. Um, let's see, so we actually, Bancor, my co-founders and I at Bancor backed in to what eventually became the Bancor protocol from a project we had been working on previously um, that was trying to let communities essentially mint their own currencies and kind of run their own local marketplaces um, using these currencies. You can think of like a Craigslist for your neighborhood, if you will, or for a group that you're a part of where you're using sort of loyalty points within the community, you're using new currency that you created uh, for the members and using that to kind of keep track of who's buying what from who. Um, we arrived at this uh, from the work of our mentor who eventually became the president of the Bancor Foundation. Uh, his name is Bernard Leotard. He's considered the godfather, if you will, or the grandfather of community currencies. And community currencies are uh, a little known these days, becoming more well-known kind of uh, field of new economic thinking or, or new monetary thinking, which essentially says, you know, the power that we give to central banks to issue currencies for our nations, which is incredibly important and kind of allows us to have, uh, have these um, well-run and hopefully well-governed uh, economies, uh, that power can also be given uh, to communities, to people, to really any group uh, to create their own currency and run a local economy. And we came across this, this work and these ideas in about 20, let's call it 20, uh, 13, 14, um, previously having discovered Bitcoin and kind of the, the beginnings of cryptocurrency in 2010 and 11. Uh, and for us, essentially, these two ideas, let's call it uh, Bitcoin and, and the, the beginning of cryptocurrency, and then what is actually a much longer theory and philosophy of community currencies, alternative currencies, they're called sometimes local currencies. Um, and we sort of fuse these two ideas together to basically say, wow, Bitcoin from our perspective as internet entrepreneurs is the first user generated currency, much like the first video uploaded you know, to YouTube or to the Meta Cafe or the sites that came before YouTube um, were the first user generated videos or, or the early forums 
that we used to call BBSs, bulletin-based uh, services, um, or the first user-generated content uh, on the internet. So for us, Bitcoin became the first user-generated currency. And uh, what we could very clearly see or what we believed was that eventually uh, there would be millions, if not hundreds of millions of these user-generated currencies, Bitcoin again being the first, maybe the, maybe the oldest, maybe the most successful, maybe, maybe the best for you know, various reasons if, if you see Bitcoin in that light. Um, but our theory was there will be millions and millions of these currencies and we want to start building tools and apps uh, for that world. And so this kind of ability to generate your own user-generated currency was very intuitive to us. And then the, the marketplace app, if you will, was sort of the, the use case. So what, what's the point of having a currency if you can't do anything with it? Um, and so we created this sort of marketplace and currency generator in one. Um, and we ran that, those projects and pilots for four years, uh, kind of between 2012, 13 to, to 16. Um, and we learned two very important things during that time. Uh, one was that the reason that new currencies don't succeed is because they actually lack liquidity to the right. existing economy. Um, and you can think of this as like if you're a brand new nation, you're an island or, you know, you want to join the UN, you want to become a new nation, you want to issue your own currency. That's great. But if no other country is going to accept your currency, you're not going to be able to import anything. You're not going to be able to export anything. Um, and so you better have sort of a, a full stack economy at your at your service. And of course, these communities that we're talking about, whether it's a community of mothers or a community of vegans or a community of, um, you know, of surfers or, or a specific neighborhood within a city. Of course, these economies don't have a complete full stack available to them of, of all the goods and services one might need. So by nature, they need to be importing and exporting. Uh, with other groups, which means any currency that they're using must be exchangeable in some way or another for the other currencies. Usually that's the national currency, right? So if you're a small neighborhood uh, in San Francisco or you're a group of mothers uh, in Tel Aviv, usually you need to be exchanging your local currency with either dollars or, or shekels. Um, and so what we realize is that no new currency can really succeed or very few of them can succeed uh, without liquidity, and that in this new world of blockchain-based currencies, you could actually program liquidity into the currency itself, meaning you could program that exchangeability, that interoperability, if you will, like allowing a, a currency or a token, in, in our case, to know at any given moment mathematically its own exchange rate with any other token not because there's a New York Stock Exchange or a NASDAQ or a Forex board that lists it, right? Because if you're a brand new community currency for mothers, no exchange like that is gonna list you. Um, you're a tiny currency by default, no one, no one knows you, no one knows how to value you. And so um, some automated permissionless kind of mathematically governed solution uh, is needed. And that, that's really how we started to think about uh, the Bancorp protocol, which is, of course, this algorithm, essentially, for how does one currency get priced vis-a-vis -vis another currency when all you know is sort of what this currency looks like and what this currency looks like. You don't right. know what the exchanges have to say about it. You don't know if it's listed anywhere. And the other big thing that happened in those uh, four years, many, many things happened, but another significant piece of the puzzle was uh, the Ethereum uh, ICO and kind of the, the emergence of a programmable token platform. Um, and so those two things together basically, you know, led us to believe that we could program a currency on top of Ethereum. It's now called Bancor Network Token or the BNT uh, or BNT. And, and we could program the Bancor protocol that, that we arrived at, which is this algorithm that kind of balances between currency A and currency B. Um, and we could, we could do that all on chain uh, with B and T sort of in the middle of that math. And, and if you could at any given moment say what A is equal to in terms of B, then you could say what A is equal to in terms of anything in the network uh, through transference, right? If A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. And so this was how we developed essentially the Bancor network 
uh, liquidity idea, which is that if you have a, a and in, in many ways it's, it's not new and I'll, I'll get to that in a moment, but if you have a currency in the middle of a network where every currency that joins the network has kind of an automated mathematical exchange rate vis-a-vis -vis that central currency, mm -hmm. then also every currency that's joined the network has an automated uh, exchange rate vis-a-vis -vis any other currency that's joined the network. You don't need sort of individual pairs uh, for every currency the way we do on exchanges, right? Or, you know, you can't go to the New York Stock Exchange and sell Apple stock for Google stock. You need to sell Apple stock for dollars and then use dollars to buy Google stock or yeah. whatever is the example. And so uh, what we wanted uh, in this kind of blockchain-based uh, exchange network or, or decentralized exchange was that permissionless uh, nature where any currency could join the network. They don't need to ask us. They don't need to ask anyone. And just by joining, they could now have automated and transparent liquidity to any other uh, currency in the network. Um, mm -hmm. And this is what we believed was kind of the next fundamental next missing piece of moving towards this multi-currency world that, that we very much believed and believe in that I think we're all seeing unfold around us, you know, to different degrees of success, different degrees of progress. Um, but at the time in 2017, when we launched uh, the Bancor Network token, um, token generation event, there certainly was nothing like this out there at the time. We had Bitcoin as sort of a, you know, a day zero, if you will, blockchain uh, MVP or blockchain based currency MVP. And then we had Ethereum as like a day one programmable uh, token infrastructure. Um, but we didn't have what, what we believe is sort of day two, um, the, the Bancor network of any currency being able to be algorithmically uh, permission, without permission, um, exchange for any other currency. And the reason I say that that some of these ideas aren't new, and in fact, even the name Bancor uh, isn't new, so to speak, is that uh, we actually were inspired. Um, yeah, I was going to ask about that. The idea of there being a currency pair, you know, some sort of global connector that allows, yeah, and creates liquidity I, from, is similar to the, the idea of Bancor. Um, maybe you want to talk about that for a sec. I know Andrew's dying to, to get a question. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll just, I'll just kind of round this like long, long brief history, which is that, you know, the idea of having a currency for currencies or what we, th what we more colloquially call a reserve currency, a global reserve currency or a, you know, a reference currency, is as old as time, right? In Game of Thrones, you had the throne that wanted their currency to be the one that everyone used. And uh, certainly at Bretton Woods in 1944, after World War II or towards the end of World War II, uh, the world, much of the world kind of got together and decided uh, to use the US dollar as this global reference currency, this glo currency, the global reserve. Um, and, and what not many people know is that there was an alternative um, proposal on the table at Bretton Woods. Um, we came across it kind of in our research into what is money and how does one mint money and how does something minted become money. Uh, and that proposal was called Bancor and it was actually made by the British. Um, uh, yeah, John Maynard, the, John Maynard Keynes, yeah, the very yeah. famous economist who was the Treasury Secretary for Britain and he was kind of the, um, you know, the ambassador to the Bretton Woods uh, conference. He brought this proposal. He actually co-authored it with another very famous economist uh, named Schumacher, uh, who's famous for a whole different bunch of reasons. He wrote uh, Small is Beautiful and um, a lot of kind of local economics theory. Um, and this proposal called Bancor basically, you know, there's a lot of politics involved, but essentially said, hey, rather than using the USD for this very sort of central role in our international economy, um, let's use a new currency that doesn't belong to any nation. We'll call it the Bancor. It'll have these, you know, this variety of features. Um, and what they proposed was that it would not give such a disproportionate amount of power to the country whose domestic currency was also that international reserve currency. Yeah. In that case, being you know, the United States and the US dollar. And the, the event that you mentioned that I that I chaired a couple of years ago now at Bretton Woods, which is this lovely, lovely spot in, um, in New Hampshire, uh, where I also went to college. And that's another way I kind of became familiar with it. 
Um, we hosted the 75th sort of memorial event to kind of look back uh, at what were the assumptions that were made back then? How have they played out? How are things going? What are new economic ideas um, that, that are out there that we can um, bring to the table? And of course, it does have a very significant effect uh, that the United States um, and the US dollar is our global reserve currency. And um, that would be the same, you know, that was the same for the Brits, by the way, just before where the pound sterling was the global uh, reserve currency. And you could look at that and say, well, you know, wanting to not be bumped from number one to number two might make you a great candidate to support a proposal that doesn't let a new number one uh, come into place. You can yeah. fast forward today and look at US-China relations. There's a whole, it's very, very, Interesting, but if I sort of bring it back to DeFi and, and where we are today in crypto, our our thesis was very much based on you know the idea that having a central uh, reserve currency, if you will, for all the different nations of blockchain, whether that's you know the different uh, platform tokens or project tokens or community currencies that would emerge over time, was very important for that currency, in our case, bank or, or BNT, to be independent, so to speak, mm. not be uh, made by a nation, of course, to not be made by a company, even Bancor is a nonprofit foundation uh, based in, uh, in Zug, Switzerland, uh, to not be made uh, by a platform. So, you know, by Ethereum itself, uh, there are other protocols that use Ether as the reserve currency, which is another model, another way to do it. Um, it was very important for us to kind of create the, the model of this, uh, you know, independent currency as, as best we could. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'll so stop there because it's a, yeah. a five hours of detail. That was, a, that was amazing. I know Andrew's, Andrew's dying to, to jump in. Um, I, can't, I can't help but, uh, um, you know, point out that I think with Bancor, I think maybe Keynes would have liked the pound to have been the reserve currency, but by the end of the war, they had no gold and they were heavily in debt and had no real leverage at the, the uh, negotiating table. So Bancor was a pretty uh, ingenious sort of um, uh, alternative, I guess, to, to that system. Um, and they say nothing's as powerful as an idea whose time has come. And maybe the system was unworkable back then, but today, obviously, we know that something like this can work technologically. Andrew, you wanted to jump into the question there. Yeah, I thought that was a great uh, segue because you're talking about how Bancor is kind of the reserve currency. And I think when sort of crypto native people think of Bancor, they think of two things, two like big innovations uh, among a, a number of them. But the first is obviously the first kind of uh, real live production AMM, completely doing away with order books, uh, which was completely sort of revolutionary. And then I think nowadays, a lot of people also think about sort of the single sided liquidity. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about, it's, which is obviously a much different model than kind of Uniswap, SushiSwap, all these other sort of other AMMs. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about how sort of Bancor differs from these other AMMs um, using this sort of single side liquidity? And, and I guess also how that allows you to sort of uh, transition to other chains uh, easier. Yeah, absolutely. And it's a, it's a great point. So you know, like, like you were saying, Alex, when you go from an idea in theory to an idea in practice, you start getting kind of into the weeds of the, you know, the model, the mechanics, the technologies that are available at the time. And when we uh, came out with Bancor, Bancor 1.0, um, the model was, you know, this two-sided token liquidity, meaning that each token that wanted to join the network, the way you would join was sort of depositing some of your new token that you want to have join the network and some of our token, the, the BNT, the network token, by our, I mean, the, the protocol token. Mm -hmm. And you would put that two-sided liquidity into a pool that would kind of kick off that initial balance in terms of like, ooh, this equals this in this moment. And then the algorithm knows how to, you know, reprice each of those tokens based on the movements um, in the pool. And that was a really great place to start. Like you said, there was nothing else like it at the time. And it was sort of the, the simplest version of, of the model. Um, but what's fun about uh, inventing things and, and launching things first is that you also kind of invent the problems that your solution creates, right? Um, and so even though our solution solved a problem being that there wasn't any automated liquidity network or infrastructure like this before, 
it also actually created a problem that we hadn't foreseen or could maybe couldn't foresee before we had scale in the network, which was this you know, new plague, consider a plague in, in uh, liquidity provision or decentralized liquidity provision, which is called impermanent loss, which I think is, is what you're alluding to. So the, the topic of impermanent loss is super interesting. It's basically what happens when, let's say I have a bunch of this, my token, Galia token that I want to enter into the bank core network so I can receive this type of like permissionless liquidity. And like I said, I have to put some of my token and some of the network token in to like initialize that upload, if you will, to the network. Um, if I had 10 of my tokens to begin with and I had to sort of sell some of them to buy the network token and then initiate that two-sided um, liquidity pool, I may not have wanted to sell any of my token to begin with. I may have just wanted to hold all my own tokens. And maybe the one that I bought, the network token, actually tanks you know, in, in the upcoming year. And so my token is now uh, relatively more expensive than it, but, but since they're in a liquidity pool together, that less performing token is like dragging my, my price down um, or hurting my holders because uh, you know, arbitragers are coming in to like fill that, that void, essentially buy my token for cheap, if you will. And so this is what's known as impermanent loss in the space. It's called impermanent because it's not an actual loss until you withdraw your position from the pool. It's like a theoretical loss of your holdings. But we all know that a theoretical loss uh, very quickly becomes an actual loss, right? Because you know if your theoretical loss is kind of piling up, at some point you are going to uh, withdraw from the pool. You might not have the ability to wait out the other token sort of rebounding or, or prices rebalancing to where you started the liquidity pool with. And so over time, as, as more and more types of liquidity providers joined this and other networks that you mentioned, like uh, Uniswap and SushiSwap that kind of took our model and, and made variations on it, whether it's using ETH as the network token or other variations, everyone across the board is experiencing this impermanent loss, which is a result, it's just a mechanical result of having to put two tokens into a pool in order to kind of upload into the network. And so in Bancor uh, V2.1, and now certainly with our, our upcoming V3, one of the one of the upsides of inventing the problems is you're also in uh, in, a, in a unique position to be able to, to solve them and sort of offer the next generation of solutions. And that's really what we did with Bancor V2.1, where we introduced single-sided liquidity provision into decentralized uh, exchanges, decentralized networks, meaning that now if I have a new token that I want to, you know, upload or, or plug in in a permissionless way to the Bancor network, I no longer need both my token, the, the new token and BNT. I can just uh, enter a pool with only my own token, meaning I have the token I always had. I don't experience the impermanent loss of sort of splitting my holdings between the one I had and maybe wanted and some other one that I, I don't know how it's going to perform. I'm not I'm no longer exposed to two assets possible movements. I'm only exposed to to my assets movements, which is you know what, what we kind of expect uh, when we when we use products like this. It's also what makes impermanent loss such a sneaky and kind of underreported problem in the space because it's not very obvious to users uh, when they use these products, what is sort of, you know, going on behind the scenes. That's not for lack of trying, you know, our, our white papers out there, everyone else's white papers are out there. All these algorithms are open source, as you mentioned. And, but you know, they're, they're pretty, you have to really like absorb them and appreciate them. Um, and, and many users uh, have found themselves exposed uh, to impermanent loss. Um, you know, and, and have been surprised by it. And so Bancor V2.1 and, and onwards from there really focuses on this, uh, on solutions to these kinds of problems that emerge from using automated market makers. Uh, and there are plenty of other ones, high gas fees, for example, like the computations that you do to have these these swaps be permissionless are, are quite intensive if you, if you want to get them right. And so they're expensive in terms of the underlying gas fees. So Bancor is really pushing forward, you know, making the making contracts more efficient so that the gas fees are lower, uh, offering single sided uh, token exposure. 
the reason that we can do single-sided exposure um, and allow users to only put one token, it sounds like such a simple idea, but it actually, because you still have that double token pool structure, that's what gives the network its, its transference ability to sort of take an exchange rate and you know, copy paste it on to, to all the other relationships in the network. Just because I've now only supplied one token doesn't mean that other token isn't there and isn't moving, right? So the reason that we can allow for users to do single-sided token exposure is because of the BNT token itself, uh, it's, it's a custom network token and it can be programmed to kind mm -hmm. of, do, you know, act in these, in these custom and unique ways in a way you can't program ETH. Um, ETH is ETH. You can't change sort of how, how ETH is being issued, but because Bancor, the Bancor network token, the one job that it has is to balance this network, um, it can now be programmed. These have been kind of upgrades to the monetary policy uh, to come and step in, essentially. You can think of the Bancor protocol as providing the other side of that two-sided token liquidity instead of the user. Um, and so it can really uh, step into those shoes, keep the pool balanced but without the user themselves needing to provide the BNT. So I don't want to get too technical. Maybe that's enough for now, but let's see. Let's see yeah, where I, that. Lands. No, that's that's great. And, and I want to talk about just some the application of this, all these innovations like in the real world of DeFi today, um, which is that it's, it's interesting that the initial vision was how do you enable communities to stand up their own currency? Um, you know, even if they don't have a full stack of an economy, which is something that's historically been a precondition to that, right? Um, but, and we're, I mean, there are tens of thousands of crypto assets uh, and many of them, I think some would say function like community currencies, but we're also seeing the technology of the AMM and what you've pioneered being applied to the, to how we exchange every kind of asset, and, that, and that's what I think is really interesting. Which is that, no, well, also interesting, which is that today, you know, a lot of dexes um, do volumes that are as great as centralized exchanges, and as more and more assets become, I don't know, digitized is the right word, um, become you know native crypto assets that live on blockchains. Um, this technology, I think, could eventually be used to, to replace or, or, or change how we exchange stocks and bonds and other financial assets, uh, traditional fiat currencies, um, as well as other kinds of more crypto native assets um, that where they're used primarily today. Um, so, you know, I know it's, it's uh, we're still early. DeFi itself is two years old, you know, um, or, or however long, whenever you want to put a pin in it to start it. Um, but already we're seeing it spreading into all these different areas. So are you surprised by that, number one? And, and number two, um, what are some other areas that you see as being really interesting, high growth areas? Definitely. Well, if, if you want to start counting DeFi from somewhere, I'd probably start counting it from 2017 uh, when we launched Bancor right after us. Yeah. Maker, you know, you know, there's a lot of yeah. kind of all early DeFi. Works. Yeah, Baker, um, notices, you, know, yeah. you, could, you could think of them as like being conceived then or, or yeah. being baby then. And in the summer of 2020, like you mentioned, or, or 2019, uh, was 20, uh, <laughs> sort of standing up, right? Or like right. being able to kind of walk around um, on their own. Mm -hmm. um, I think what you said is absolutely true. We've actually said it from day one that, you know, the Bancor protocol can be used essentially to exchange anything that we want to exchange globally, whether that's commodities, whether that's stocks and bonds, whether that's, uh, you know, real assets, security tokens, when those come online, um, we're even now seeing these models extend to NFTs, right? Can you kind of pool NFTs together and give that some automated uh, pricing mechanic where you can borrow or lend uh, against those, um, against those assets. So, um, you know, if we take a step back and say one of the, the main tenets or themes of blockchain as an industry is being able, in many cases, to remove the middleman, um, that's really what you have here in terms of removing the traditional order book from 
any kind of transaction. Um, and, and it's not that you've removed, it's not just that you've removed the middleman, it's that you've made the middleman every man and woman. Um, essentially saying we can all together in, in any given network, whether it's Bancor or the New York Stock Exchange or others, we can all together perform this service uh, of kind of providing liquidity to a marketplace and settling or clearing uh, transactions, which before was a function that was, you know, reserved specifically for market makers, liquidity providers, the stock exchange itself, right, the exchange marketplace itself. Um, and with these technologies, you're starting to truly decentralize uh, those middlemen type of roles. And, and like you say, we can, we can take the model and we can apply it broadly to transactions of any kind. Mm -hmm. um, and that, you know, if you ask me kind of what's the most interesting, it's not necessarily the most uh, timely in the sense that, you know, I don't, I don't think the, the NICE or the NASDAQ or, or your markets in Canada are gonna move to automated market makers tomorrow, um, but I think they're gonna move to them for sure. Um, eventually, it's like, you know, asking if a company is gonna move to email, like eventually, yes. Um, and so I think the most interesting thing about DeFi is not necessarily where it is today, but where it started in terms of its intentionality, because that is, is certainly eventually where it's going, uh, meaning the ability to uh, decentralize previously, uh, you know, earmarked roles, either for capital holders, for uh, rule makers, for, uh, you know, market monopolies, different, different market participants, uh, in a way that, that really begins to give more people uh, the opportunities that today are, are reserved for the few. Yeah, I love that. Andrew, do you have anything? Yeah, no, I, I think one of the things I really wanted to kind of ask you as well, because I was uh, over the last kind of eight months, obviously, like you said, initially when we started, Ethereum was kind of the only place to be for DeFi activity. And, and really it has been kind of the dominant platform up until kind of the last eight months, things have really, really started to shift um, to these other networks, things like Polygon or, uh, Optimism, Arbitrum, and and now like Solana and, and sort of these other other platforms. I know Bancor was was kind of a pioneer in going cross chain, uh, going to sort of EOS way back in the day. Um, how do you guys think about sort of this multi chain future and and how how are you sort of positioning Bancor for um, yeah this multi chain future? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So it's a it's a tender area that you mentioned. Um, because like with, with many things, being first is, uh, is like a costly and sometimes painful endeavor. But like you said, we were the first uh, protocol period, but certainly the first uh, AMM to build a fully functional cross-chain bridge uh, between the two ecosystems that were uh, live at the time, which were Ethereum that we all know, and EOS that maybe some folks are less familiar with, but had sort of the next uh, production level working blockchain out there with developers and apps and and you know governance system and and uh, and a live trading token and plenty of liquidity. Um, so we built a bridge. It was called Bancor X, uh, and it made BNT the first cross platform uh, token. Made Bancor Network the first cross platform DEX. And again, that was really based on our vision that in order to be a true liquidity network. Um, and a decentralized one at that, you couldn't be centralized on one particular blockchain. Um, I think the, you know, the strategic unfolding of that is that it was way too soon and EOS didn't take off nearly fast enough to kind of warrant the, the type of engineering investment and uh, you know, resource allocation uh, that was put into a bridge like that. But it was certainly visionary in the sense that uh, you know, three years later, we're now seeing, like you said, multiple chains, the successful projects will span all of them, all of the ones uh, that matter, and definitely more than one of them will matter, more than one of them already matters, uh, like you said. And so I think that what's, what hasn't changed is the vision of a multi-currency, multi-blockchain uh, world with sort of true decentralized interoperability between them. Um, what has changed, I think, is where the balance is of resources that need to be invested in order to build such a bridge. 
So in the, you know, back in the day, if you will, 2018, when we built the bridge, it was all on us. It was all on Bancor to build that bridge. Um, you know, EOS was building sort of a full stack chain from their perspective. Uh, developers were coming to them for particular reasons, lower gas fees, you know, different model. Um, and we, we put a lot of time and, and energy and, and, and costs into building such a bridge, kind of manually bridging these two ecosystems so that Bancor and then hopefully other tokens could kind of run across that bridge. Today, I think what we're seeing, because the other blockchain, the kind of the additional layer one or layer two ecosystems is matured, those ecosystems between themselves are in somewhat of a fierce competition um, for developers, for traction, for, um, for you know, use cases. And so they are actually putting the resources in to build the bridges between their ecosystems and the other ones, which is, I think, a much healthier model, right? If you're a blockchain, like if you're a nation, you should build the bridges. You and the other nations should build the bridges between you. And then you know, the, the cars can run on them. Bancor was sort of like a car, right? An app on top of a, an ecosystem that was then also building the road and trying to run the car on the road. And um, I think we now have a more sort of healthy distribution uh, of incentives and, and um, resources that those bridges are getting built. And once the bridges are, are built, the cars are going to are gonna run on them, right? And, and then you have again, a more healthy, I think, ecosystem dynamic where in order to attract cars or apps or tokens or developers, if you will, to your blockchain, whether you're Solana or Celo or Ethereum, you're just going to have to be the best at what you do. Mm -hmm. um, and so maybe you're the best at being a blockchain for NFTs, or maybe you're the best at being a blockchain for financial inclusion, or maybe you're the best at being the cheapest, you know, lowest gas blockchain, or maybe you have the best regulatory uh, you know, uh, grandfathering in or whatever. Um, but I think that's kind of competition in its, in its true essence, where the blockchains will compete on, on real value in an environment where there's fluid motion between them and where apps and tokens will kind of naturally flow uh, to wherever they want to go. They won't be artificially restricted by a bank or, or another developer needing to like painstakingly, you know, weave the bridge uh, between two ecosystems. Yeah, I, I love that for so many reasons. Um, the idea of, first of all, you know, not being a maximalist and understanding that there's lots of room and, and actually it's not even room, it's it's demand for uh, capacity. <laughs> you know, there's there's an explosion of interest in, um, and, use, and using of DeFi and NFTs and stable coins and everything. And it's just a, just a simple requirement of, of the demand side of this market that there needs to be more capacity. So in my view, like that's one of the main reasons that you're seeing a proliferation and room for lots of different uh, blockchains. But I also love the idea of different, not if not application specific, then, then um, sort of thematic blockchains in a, in a way, the idea that, you know, you'd have some that are good at good for certain things and maybe um, others that are good for other things. And, you know, Andrew, I know that's a thesis that you believe in too, because SX network is basically a blockchain for prediction markets. That's where a lot of the leading, you know, prediction market applications are, are looking to build. Um, and so I wish we had more time to, to talk about, to, un, to pull on that thread a little bit more. Um, the good news though, well, is that maybe, yeah. maybe they'll be regional, right. And, and maybe, maybe yeah. they will be both. Maybe there'll be a blockchain that is just much more micro tailored to a Latin American context or to having smooth, you know, fiat on off ramping to a particular currency uh, or using a particular wallet. Like I think it, time will tell how it, how it unfolds, but the, the blockchains that will be successful will be particularly successful at doing something. Um, whether it's catering to a particular audience or catering to a particular use case. Yeah, I love that. Well, the good news for our listeners is that we're recording this on Monday, November 1st. It should be online by tomorrow, uh, which means by the time you hear this, you'll still have one more day to sign up for an event that um, a speaking club in, in Canada is hosting. It's called the Canadian Club. I'll be giving a talk and then we'll have a, an expert panel and Galia, you'll be joining for that as well. So you've been very generous with your time uh, this week and in general um, as a member of uh, Office DeFi's advisory council and as a friend of, of the podcast and as a collaborator of ours. So 
we do really appreciate it. Um, it was an amazing discussion. If people want to learn more where and, um, and follow what you're doing, what, where should they go? Um, you can really learn everything there is to learn at Bancor.network. Um, you can kind of surf. That, that's the product itself. But you can surf from there to our FAQ and our developer resources and to our social channels. Um, and certainly if, uh, if anyone wants to get in touch with you and, um, and ask me questions, then I welcome that as well. Well, we appreciate that. Um, that's all of the time we have for today. It's been an amazing discussion. Um, we'll pick it up in a couple of days time. Um, I know a lot of people will be listening to this hopefully in a year, you know, if it has long legs, but November 3rd, 2021, your conversation will continue. Um, but until then, thank you very much. Uh, great chat, Andrew, uh, as always, great to see you. Um, and we will see everybody else next week. Um, we have John Wu, who is the CEO of Ava Labs, joining us on the podcast. Uh, another uh, great leader in the field. So stay tuned for that. And that's all. Take care, everyone. Cool. Well, thanks, everyone. See you soon. The information contained herein does not constitute an offer or solicitation by anyone in the United States or in any other jurisdiction in which such an offer or solicitation is not authorized or to any person to whom it is unlawful to make such an offer or solicitation. Prospective investors who are not residents in Canada should contact their financial advisor to determine whether securities of the funds may be lawfully sold in their jurisdiction. 